lot of matter in periodically driven Floquet systems. Please. Hello, hello. Yeah, that's better. Yeah, that's fantastic. Good. Okay. Can people hear me well? Okay. Fantastic. Uh, great. So, um, yeah, it's great to see so many of you here. Some familiar faces, some not so familiar faces. Um, uh, Anatoly and I tried to collaborate on our lectures a little bit, so some of the discussions and themes that I'll try to reinforce were hopefully already introduced a little bit in Anatoly's uh, lectures from this morning. And uh, yes, as uh, Alessandra mentioned, I'll generally be trying to tell you a story, although very slowly and carefully, about a modern research topic which is really about thinking about and exploring new phases of matter in periodically driven or flow K systems. Uh, just a couple of references. Um, Probably not today, but maybe sort of, you know, in the next lecture, I'll mention some stuff that I first learned in a summer school, uh, from a Boulder summer school exactly 10 years ago from some lecture notes from David Hughes. There's um, an annual review of condensed matter physics from 2020 from myself and some of, some of our friends. And then a more recent review of modern physics on this also this broad topic of phases of matter and periodically driven systems just from this year. And there's a very, very nice, um, annual review of condensed matter physics from Takahiji Mori, uh, also about periodically driven systems as well as open systems. So the broad focus of the lecture today and probably tomorrow mostly as well is going to be on a topic that has uh, received quite a lot of recent research interest that um, goes under the name of time crystals. Whether or not that's an apt name, we'll soon see for ourselves. Um, and what I really hope to be able to do kind of very slowly and precisely is to explain carefully what the question surrounding time crystals actually is, when that particular question is interesting to help answer the question that I always get in lectures and talks, which is, is blank a time crystal? Uh, and I'll also, uh, I have a love, much like your, for your previous lecture, Anatoly, for classical, dynamical, nonlinear systems. So I'll try to very, very precisely connect the modern question on time crystals to really old school questions in classical, nonlinear, dynamical systems. So very broadly speaking, the school is about out of equilibrium physics, many body quantum physics. Uh, there certainly will be some quantum, there will certainly be many body, and there will be some out of equilibrium. But I suspect that, more truthfully, the topic of time crystals and the one that I'll try to explain in detail over the next couple of lectures is really an intersection between three different subsets, each of which could be sort of their own you know, line of research and are their own line of research. Broadly, that being flow K systems, so periodically driven systems. Uh, the question of phases of matter is inevitably correlated with the notion of spontaneous symmetry breaking. I'll try to very precisely explain what that is. And then, uh, thanks to Anatoly, we've already seen questions about when a many-body system, or even a few-body system, is able to forget its initial conditions, or in a broad sense, you know, be able to reach ergodicity. And it turns out the stability of time crystals, or phases of matter in flow case systems in general, will require some robust mechanism for ergodicity breaking, which by itself is not, uh, not an easy question. So I should emphasize, just uh, in the title of the school, that my picture for sort of how non-equilibrium, so let me sort of, if I had an axis for non-equilibriumness, I would say at one fixed point there are truly equilibrium systems, so static, for example, systems. And I would argue that really where we're going to sit for most of the lecture is not that far away from equilibrium. It's kind of the simplest example of a non-equilibrium system, and those are of course, as I've been mentioning, flow K systems where essentially the equations of motion return back to themselves after some period T. We'll get into a lot more detail about this, but just to put some context in mind. So 
I think it's always really, really important, especially I, I wish this was the case for me when I was a younger student. I want to emphasize, I mean, we're going to be talking for almost five hours about uh, this broad topic, but I think one always, it's extremely important as a young student to ask two questions whenever somebody like myself is introducing a modern research topic to you. So two questions that one should ask really of any research topic. And I promise to try to address each of these as we go, but they're very, very important. And I think really this is kind of, yeah, at some level when one matures in research, one really develops a taste for the types of questions to ask. And it's very helpful to contextualize always in these two questions. The first is why now? Why is it that this particular set of questions is being asked, you know, at this present moment in time. And in the context of periodically driven systems, I would say this question is particularly apt because flow case systems, or in general, periodically driven systems, and I apologize, I think, yeah, I think the, my, the writing's up there anyways, but if something's unclear, I'm not known for either the quality or size of my handwriting, so please just call out and I'll, I'll try to clarify. So periodically driven systems have been around, been around for a very long time. So why is it that people are asking about phases of matter in these systems? Why has it become such a hot topic in terms of modern research? And I would say this is true even, even kind of experimentally this is true, kind of classic NMR experiments could be thought of as a many body, somewhat quantum versions of periodically driven questions. And the second question that I think is also really important to ask, and I will also try to ask, is that if the title of a particular series of lectures is of the form, is of the form something interesting, is of the form something interesting in the law. The law could be anything. So clearly my titles of this form, phases of matter, interesting things that one learns about in physics, uh, but I'm talking about them in the context of periodically driven flow case systems. I think it's always, you should always ask the question, is the in necessary. Very important. And what I mean by that is could, couldn't one get the same physics, couldn't one get the same physics in a non-flow case system? feels very much like extremely broad philosophical-ish questions, but it's really important. It's really important. When people are telling you about modern research, you should ask the question, why is that particular question asked now? It could be because of an insight. It could be because the tools that one has allows one to ask that question now. One should also ask the question, if people are studying a particular phenomenon in an open system, in a monitored system, in a periodically driven system, could the same phenomenon, in a quantum system, could the same phenomenon occur without that particular qualifier? Or what is intrinsically important about the qualifier that enables the particular phenomenology that one's looking at? So I claim that generically, the answer to question two, and we'll see this in this series of lectures, the answer to the second question can be one of two cases. One case, which I think is reasonably true for time crystals, is context. What I mean by that is that the question is only reasonable, is only valid, the question's only well-defined to ask in, for example, a flow K system. So that's a case where the question is necessary in the sense that the context of the question is required for the definition. And a second 
answer, which is not any more interesting, but it's distinct, is that there is something intrinsically floquet about the phenomenon that one talks about. And what I mean there is that, for example, it's somehow, for some reason, forbidden, or there's some generic obstruction to realizing the phenomenon in equilibrium. So again, and I promise I will try to always contextualize as I go where we are and how we think about this question to be able to answer these two questions to give you a flavor of why people are asking this particular question now. Okay, so with that, I think we're essentially ready to start our foray into the first topic that will make up certainly all of this lecture and I suspect a lot of the next one, which is the topic of Classical and quantum time crystals. And of course, just like in Anatoly's lecture, please, now that you're full of energy after lunch, ask, feel free to call out questions, raise your hand. If I don't see you, just call out. Okay, so I'll try to start by making sure we're all on the same page. I suspect that this will be review for many of you, but nonetheless, I think it's important to get the language straight. I'll start by trying to ignore the word time and just introduce the idea of crystals or crystalline order in space, which is something that you're very intuitively familiar with. And I suspect many of you are also familiar with thinking about crystals as a phase of matter in the context of spontaneous symmetry breaking and in the particular context of a spontaneous spatial translation symmetry breaking. And I absolutely promise that I will unpack all of these words as we continue. So as a very general rule of thumb, and this is also true in Floquet systems, in equilibrium, we oftentimes think of phases of matter as defined with respect to the notion of spontaneously breaking a symmetry. Specifically in the context of crystals, we often think about it in terms of the breaking of a spatial translation symmetry, and we'll sort of carry this analogy through when we start to ask the question about what a time crystal is. Okay, so I guess, I guess this board is probably still okay, right? Maybe the four boards in the center? Okay, fantastic. Good. So in the context of symmetry breaking, I would say as a very, very general statement that in equilibrium, so we won't get to non-equilibrium for a little bit, but in equilibrium, phases of matter are often described and even classified, classified according to a particular framework, according to a particular framework, which is oftentimes called the landau Ginsberg framework of spontaneous symmetry breaking, which I'll oftentimes abbreviate as SSB. And conceptually, this framework has a very, very simple idea, which we'll illustrate in a very, very easy way in just a little bit. But just to write out the English words, conceptually, the idea is that, in fact, the low energy states of, for example, a many body system can exhibit, exhibit a lower symmetry, and again, I'll be precise about what that means in just a second, a lower symmetry or a less symmetric behavior than their parent Hamiltonian than the equations of motion that describe them in the first place. So normally, we think about a collection, a many particle system, a collection of interacting particles. They're described by some equation of motion some of you might like the Lagrangian formalism, some of you might like the Hamiltonian formalism, but there's some description of the equations of motion of the system, and I'll define exactly what I mean by symmetry, 
But it's possible that the low energy states of that many body system, for example, that are accessed as one decreases the temperature, exhibit properties that are less symmetric than their parent Hamiltonian. And we'll illustrate this concept very simply via, via a very simple example. And in particular, we're going to discuss what I would say is really one of the classic kind of textbook examples, textbook examples to illustrate this concept. Okay. So we'll work this through together just to understand the notion of spontaneous symmetry breaking and in particular to define a spatial crystal. In particular, let's imagine together, imagine together that we are writing down some theory, we're writing down some theoretical description of a complex scalar field phi of x and time. So x could be in three space, could be in two space, but some theory describing a complex scalar field phi of x and t. And intuitively, you can imagine that this scalar field is, for example, the field associated with the creation slash annihilation is the field associated with the creation slash annihilation of some types of bosonic particles. If you're a cold atom aficionado, rubidium 87, if you're a more solid state old school, helium 4. Um, but you would just have some scalar field as you would write down thinking about a very simple field theory, the fields associated with the creation annihilation of some bosonic particles, or just for the more magnetism inclined folks, this could also be very simply describing the distribution of some planar spin density. So for example, we imagine some spin density in the xy plane then that complex scalar field can tell me where in the xy plane that object points. So our starting point for illustrating this very simple example and why we think about phases of matter in the language for spontaneous symmetry breaking is thinking about writing down a theory of some complex scalar field. Physically, it could be anything, very general, it could be the creation annihilation of bosonic particles or the distribution of a planar spin density or the creation annihilation of Cooper pairs. And when we talk about symmetry, symmetry is also a supernatural idea that you already have some intuition or some gut feeling for, I would say. A symmetry of the theory or a symmetry of the equations of motion is some transformation, some transformation that does not change the theory. So again, just thinking about the definition, the literal definition of a symmetry, that makes sense. It's some transformation that does not change, does not change the nature of the equations of motion or the nature of the theory. Okay. And in the example, in this kind of textbook example, there are maybe two extremely common examples of transformations that one could imagine. Just literally from noting the fact that we have a complex scalar field in the first place. Perhaps my favorite, I guess, is a phase transformation where we can imagine that the scalar field, for example, is invariant under some phase. Phi goes to e to the i lambda phi. Again, super very super general statement. We're not making any microscopic state. We're just saying, okay, what could be an allowed symmetry given that we have a complex scalar field that we're trying to describe? And one that will be very, very relevant, very relevant for the language of time crystals is spatial translation symmetry. You might expect that, for example, the Hamiltonian or the equation of motion is the same at all points in space. 
these are two examples of symmetries, transformations that could, for example, leave the nominal equation of motion to the nominal theory describing my complex scalar field the same. And we'll see why symmetries are so important in thinking about the physics of low energy configurations of our scalar field in just a second. And it turns out that in this case, you might argue that the kind of simplest equations of motion, or if we're really used to thinking about the language of Hamiltonians, the simplest energy functional, the simplest energy functional that is in fact consistent with the transformations above, with the symmetries above, you could write down a potential energy of the form, some coefficient, which is a real valued coefficient, but I haven't told you more than that. Let's call the coefficient A2 y squared, very natural naming convention A4, phi to the 4, say B2 grad phi squared, gradients are taken in space, derivatives in space, and B4 grad phi to the 4. I suspect many of you have seen this, this is sort of you know, a really classic textbook example, but important to get the language straight. One might write down a very simple energy functional for my complex scalar field phi, a2 phi squared, a4 phi to the 4, and some gradients in space, b2 grad phi squared plus b4 grad phi to the 4. I guess if you're Lagrangian aficionado, this is minus the Lagrangian. And before going further and analyzing a couple of limiting cases here, let me also just very quickly note for a second that one can also go the other way. So here, I'm kind of starting from thinking about what I want the symmetries of the theory to be, and then writing down an energy functional or a Hamiltonian that's consistent with said symmetries. But oftentimes, it also goes the other way, where one has, for example, some phenomenological description that's given to oneself of the Hamiltonian. So, for example, oftentimes one is given a Hamiltonian, and then, in order to think about symmetry breaking or phases of matter, one then identifies the symmetries. Identifies the symmetries of the Hamiltonian. And in some sense, the low temperature phases of matter that are allowed are those that correspond to symmetry broken states of that Hamiltonian that one is given. So just either way. As usual, the question that one asks when one has an energy functional like this or has written down a free energy or a Hamiltonian of some form is what are the field configurations? What are the field configurations of my complex scalar field, phi? What are the field configurations that are, in fact, low energy and thus, as one, for example, decreases temperature, are favored as one decreases the temperature. Okay, so I think, hopefully, I'm keeping everyone, everyone with me. But just in case, are there any questions at this point? Again, I think most of you hopefully have seen something like this. If not, it should be, in, some, in a few seconds, a very, very intuitive way to think about why people, especially in stat mech, describe phases of matter in the context of this notion of symmetry breaking. But everything's clear. <laughs> 
it's, uh, it'll, it'll, it's, it's important actually, you know, the, the, the higher order terms are important actually to make the theory sort of not free, to make the theory interacting. Yeah, yeah. Sure, that's right, that, that's actually correct, but it turns out I'll make it, when I want to make an analogy of this kind of like Mexican hat potential, I'll actually want to have that term to be able to get my Mexican hat. So, but you'll see in a second. Good, so the question at the stage that we're asking whenever we have an energy function of this form is what are the field configurations that are low energy? And the answer is, of course, that it depends on the particular parameters that one's chosen for describes the Hamiltonian A2, B2, A4, B4. And if one focuses for a second, first, on the non-gradient terms, on just the phi squared and the phi four term, and one considers the following case where A2 is less than zero, but A4 is greater than zero, exactly an analogy to the question that was just asked, it turns out you can kind of immediately see if you plotted the potential potential energy as a function of phi, that in fact, states with phi non-zero are energetically favorable. Energetically favorable. And a very, very simple idea. So if we were to plot the energy as a function of phi, we'd see that there's, or some drawing, just one two-dimensional cut, right? That the energy is a function of phi, it turns out has this shape, and the minimum of the energy happens at finite values of phi, finite values in the x direction. And we say in this case, we precisely say in this case, that there is, in fact, that because of this, there is the spontaneous breaking of this phase rotation symmetry. This phase rotation symmetry. Once I pick a particular value for phi in my Mexican hat, for example, now I'm no longer going to be able to rotate in this kind of x, y plane in the e to the i lambda because I picked a particular direction. And so, in the thermodynamic limit, we say that there's a spontaneous breaking of this phase rotation symmetry. And either in the language of bosons or in the language of magnets, can somebody yell out for me what exactly the type of phase of matter this corresponds to? Mumbling, but no one said it. Confidence. What? Yes, exactly, exactly. Perfect. So beautiful. So in the case of a, uh, in the case of magnetism, we would say this is like an X Y ferromagnet. Exactly. So the particular phase of matter. So the phase of matter. Beautiful. Well answered. Is an X Y ferromagnet, or, for example, in the context of bosons, uh, a superfluid let's say of helium-4, for example, if phi was corresponding to the creation and annihilation of helium-4 particles. Yeah. Good. So the concept's very, very simple. At some level, we think about writing down some equation of motion, some Hamiltonian. We look at the symmetries of that, and we ask, what are the low energy configurations of a field? And it turns out, as you can already see here, that in certain cases, depending on the parameter regime, the system will win a non-zero energy per unit volume in order to be in a state that is less symmetric. And thus, when one decreases temperature in the thermodynamic limit, the only states that are accessible by the many-body system are, in fact, those that spontaneously break that particular symmetry of the parent Hamiltonian. 
For each type of symmetry breaking, there is an associated nomenclature for the particular phase of matter that this describes. In the context of this phase rotation symmetry, XY ferromagnets or planar ferro, easy plane ferromagnets or superfluidity is the right word. Okay. Okay. Let's quickly analyze a second case. And this will help answer the question why I wanted to sort of have that analogy. So in the second case, I want you to think about exactly the same thing, but now essentially don't worry about the non-gradient terms, just focus on the gradient terms and keep B2 less than zero, B4 greater than zero. And in this case, you will have that states with grad phi being non-zero are energetically favorable. Energetically favorable. States with grad phi non-zero are energetically favorable. And again, you can think by analogy in this kind of Mexican hat picture. And what this corresponds to is we would say in words that in fact there is now a spontaneous breaking of the spatial translation symmetry. I would say in words that there is now a spontaneous breaking of the spatial translation symmetry. Previously, we had that H, the equation of motion, the description of the system, the theory, was the same at all points in space. But if the gradient, the derivative of the complex scalar field is non-zero, this means it has to be changing in space. So by definition, we now say that we have the spontaneous breaking of a spatial translation symmetry. And oftentimes, this is also called the emergence of spatial, and now let me really use the word crystals here, spatial, for example, crystalline patterns. So the spontaneous breaking of the spatial translation symmetry indeed leads to a phase of matter that is a crystal. Because now one has some spatial pattern or some spatial crystalline pattern. It's very subtle, I, I understand the question, very subtle. So the question is basically, okay, if you wanted to have a super solid phase, this is a very good question, a super solid phase, um, it seems like basically you want to break both translation symmetry and you'd also want to break, for example, phase rotation symmetry. So I think one answer, I'm not sure this will be, this is the answer that I know the best, but I'm not sure it fully answers the most non-trivial case of this, is that oftentimes it turns out at least super solids that I know of, especially in cold atomic systems, are in different directions. So oftentimes one has, for example, stripy super solids, where one has, for example, spatial translation symmetry in sort of a stripe pattern in one direction, and superfluid order in the sense of a phase, basically stiffness in the other direction. I don't actually know, maybe other people do, uh, what exactly the answer is um, in the totally generic case. I think it's still possible to actually have a super solid where basically, in fact, there is no distinction between this, but the clearest one in my mind is where you literally have a distinction between the two. Good. Other questions? Okay, excellent. So. I hope what this example has sort of walked us through in a very, very slow and simple way is exactly as I said. The conclusion is in fact by reducing, by reducing the symmetry, by reducing the symmetry of the particular field configuration, of the particular field configuration of phi, this system has in fact gained or lowered its energy by some non-zero 
energy per unit volume. Sorry, I can even tell my handwriting is getting smaller. But hopefully, on the projected screen, it's still very big. Good. And again, this means that in the thermodynamic limit, the symmetry of the system at low temperatures, at low energy, wants to be less than the symmetry of the original equations of motion, the Hamiltonian that we read down. And in fact, what we've talked about thus far, this is precisely the mechanism of spontaneous symmetry breaking in equilibrium. Just illustrated via this example. Yeah, please. Yeah, because there's no time dependence. The Hamilton, good question, good question, good question. Here, I'm assuming that there's no time dependence in the Hamiltonian. It's sort of everything static. It's just described by equations of motion that don't change in time. Good. So now let's build on this analogy and try to define, at least conceptually, what we would want to think about as a time crystal. And in particular, we'll again use the language of spontaneous symmetry breaking. But now, instead of spatial translation symmetry, we'd like to ask about the spontaneous breaking of a time translation symmetry. So the broad thing I'd like you to keep in mind is that we'd like to think about time crystals with respect to the spontaneous time translation symmetry breaking. It's a mouthful to say and a handful to write, so oftentimes I'll abbreviate the spontaneous breaking of a time translation as S tau B. Yeah, please. Sorry, why am I saying, say, say it one more time, I just can't hear the question, say it one more time. Why am I saying, yeah, I heard the first part, just the second part. Okay, perfect, even better. So uh, why are you telling when this expectation value of phi not equals to zero to be um, phase uh, rotational symmetry and when uh -huh. this expectation value of this, okay. uh, this derivative of phi not equals to zero to be a um, spatial, uh, spatial good, good, translation. Good, yeah. Sorry, I, didn't, I must have not explained the picture well enough. Good. So this phase, so we have a complex field, phi, right? And you can imagine that complex field is literally just you know, some polar angle, e to the i theta, r e to the i theta in the xy plane, right? And if I say that it's invariant under this, it means it's invariant under any phase rotation basically in this plane, right? But if, if I've picked a particular value for phi, then I've picked a particular angle in this complex, in this complex plane. And that means that that particular angle that I've picked, it's, if I multiply by e to the light lambda, it'll certainly rotate, but it will not be invariant anymore. Unless lambda happened to be the trivial case of 2 pi. So that's what I mean by if you have a quantum expectation value, but classically just having states that have that property, um, then we say that basically that phase rotation is broken. For the translation symmetry, I think it's even nicer. It's even more intuitive. So spatial translation symmetry says that the equation of motion, the description of what happens, is at every single point in space the same. And in order for a state to have that same property, there must be no gradient. It must be that, for example, this scalar field, this you know, the complex scalar field, phi, grad phi has to equal zero. Because if there was a gradient, that means that at any epsilon x, there's some change. And that change would mean that at some later location, just following it, you would see that basically it's no longer the same phi. So knowing that the gradient of phi is non-zero means that you have to have broken the statement that h is the same at all points in space. Clear? Excellent. Okay. So 
Let's now talk about sort of you know, the exact analogy for spontaneous time translation symmetry breaking. And this, I think, is precisely the language that Frank Wilczek, Frank Wilczek and also Al Shapir and Frank Wilczek wrote, I think, in a pair of papers back 11 years ago in 2012. And in fact, it is perhaps supernatural to imagine generalizing generalizing the formalism that we wrote down there, either Hamiltonian or Lagrangian, to try to put space and time on the same footing. Space and time on the same footing. And in particular, one can imagine, by literal analogy, to consider adding the leading order kinetic terms to the Lagrangian, so things that have now derivatives in time. And you might say, okay, by direct analogy, let's now add a couple of extra terms. We know what spatial translation symmetry leading to crystals look like. Let's think about time translation symmetry and what types of terms you would want to have in such a Lagrangian. You might say it's something like a coefficient C2 dt phi squared plus c4 Ooh. dt phi to the 4. Right. Almost building like literally a direct analogy. And the analogy would state, for example, that in fact if you had c2 less than 0, c4 greater than 0, then it would in fact seem that we have energetically favorable field configurations, it's energetically favorable for states to have dt, excuse me, dt phi not equal to zero. And literally almost just replacing the word space with time, we would say here that again, If we have equations of motion that do not change in time, here, given the fact that dt phi is non-zero, we have the spontaneous breaking of a time translation symmetry, of a time translation symmetry, and physically, of course, physically what this corresponds to, much like we had spatial crystalline patterns emerging over there, here we would have physically repetitions or repetitive patterns of the field configuration, of the configuration of psi in time. And I'm using a lot of words, repetitive pattern of a configuration in time, but really the most intuitive way to think about this is that just like you have periodicity in space for a crystalline pattern, here what we really mean just intuitively here is that we would have periodic oscillations in time oscillations in time, periodic oscillations in time. And that at some level will be what most of the discussion that we'll work on together for the next couple days will be about, about when we can get interesting periodic oscillations in time that are intrinsically many body, maybe intrinsically quantum mechanical, but that are very non-trivial. Okay, is the analogy, I'm trying to sort of build up sort of this uh, intuitive analogy very, very slow. Yeah, please. I'm oh, sorry, one more time, one more time, I apologize. So far we have focused on uh, SSP. 
Landau paradigm. What about the topological phase of matter? How yeah, okay, so that is a very, very good question. That's a good, good question. So uh, at the moment, we forget about topology. So for the moment, we're only talking about, you know, at the moment, with time crystals, we'll only really discuss in the language of symmetry breaking. But I promise that in the third lecture, we will do an example of a symmetry protected topological phase that's unique in the case of flow K systems. So in that case, we'll, we'll, we'll sort of get both sides of the coin, SSB and topology as well. And then if there's really time, if I manage to fly through, we'll also do a topological band structure. Good, other questions? Yes, please. Yeah, good. So in principle, at the moment, basically over here, when I think about this type of symmetry breaking, I haven't appealed to any type of spatial translation symmetry breaking. So in principle, I'd like to define time crystals, at least the symmetry breaking associated with time translation symmetry independent of everything else. So you can imagine that you have equations of motion where there's no spatial translation symmetry, no phase rotation, no other symmetry except time translation symmetry. And a time crystal is defined most cleanly in that context as breaking of that time translation symmetry. So I, I guess the point is that here, the word crystal, don't think about crystal as like, you know, a crystal in space. Think about a crystal as a crystal in time. Like the point is that basically these periodic oscillations, I, I think that's what you mean. I think you're sort of saying like, oh, well, if you have a crystal, is that what you mean? Just saying that the word crystal sort of makes us think basically about objects that are sort of crystalline in space. Just what I mean by that is don't worry about that. I can imagine basically something that's totally uniform in space, but just oscillates in time. And that periodicity in time is what one means by a time crystal. So it's not like time by itself and the crystal by itself is one word. Sorry, why I think is it, what sorry, he, he means that a crystal has a discrete yeah. symmetry, yeah. right? So you can translate forward by a certain. Yeah, in general, that's right. Yeah, so sorry. So you break basically, yes, exactly. So maybe this is something that I'll, I'll get to in just one second. But here, I know, we'll, we, will, we will actually get there in just one second. When I talk about spatial translations, I should have really said that it's continuous spatial translations. Because I'm imagining the fact that I could, for example, move an epsilon amount in space, an arbitrary small amount, and the Hamiltonian is the same. And normally, crystals, are the breaking of a continuous spatial translation symmetry down to a discrete one. And here, in fact, I'm thinking about the same thing. I want you to start imagining, basically, a continuous time translation symmetry. And this time crystal, in this case, would break that down to a discrete time translation symmetry. Okay. But it turns out that actually won't be the relevant question for almost all of this. But it's a, it's a very good question. Yeah, please. It is coming from? Did you start by saying that there is a crystalline structure and then with where is the periodicity and repetition coming is what I missed? The, the periodicity, it's a good, good, good. The periodicity is coming from energetic, is coming from energetic penalties. It's coming from the fact that if I had an energy functional like that, the configuration that's low energy has, for example, a finite value in this you know, example of a phase rotation of phi over here. And that finite value is picked spontaneously in the thermodynamic limit to be something. But it's picked spontaneously because of the fact that that energy functional has this type of a shape. You could imagine a situation where the energy functional doesn't have this type of shape, it's totally symmetric, and has its lowest point at phi equals zero. In that case, we would have no symmetry breaking, no phase rotational symmetry breaking, because then we would know that states at low energy want to have phi equal to zero. So it's sort of, you know, kind of an emergent property of the many-body system, this notion of spontaneous symmetry breaking. Clear? Good. Beautiful. Uh, maybe you'd end this and then this. Purely classical. Yeah, nothing quantum. <laughs>
Well, I haven't gotten there yet. I have, so I, I will claim already right now that, uh, I'll say these are words for now, but you know, they'll, be, they'll make Anatoly very happy. Or it depends, it depends on Anatoly's mood. Uh, but, so, uh, but I would say, you know, really, the nature of the symmetry breaking of a time crystal is not quantum mechanical at all. The nature of the order associated with time translation symmetry is not quantum mechanical at all. But as, okay, as I had drawn somewhere over there in the past, I emphasized that to really think about time crystals as phases of matter, we needed to have some mechanism for ergodicity breaking. And it turns out that my perspective on this is that there may be uniquely quantum mechanical strategies to break or delay ergodicity, or may not be. But in that sense, basically, the order or the symmetry breaking is not quantum mechanical, but the ergodicity breaking could be quantum mechanical. Um, so we haven't started talking about this, but I just want to clarify. If we're talking about like um, time crystal and order in a flow K system, so we're already imposing, like we're already breaking the Yes, yes, like, yes, yes, you're, you're, one, you're one step ahead of me. Yes, exactly, it's prescient, but just one step ahead, we'll get there in a second. Yes, absolutely. Okay. absolutely. Yeah, please. C call out, call out. I can't. It's a good question. I think, yeah, so when you break a continuous symmetry, in general, you have uh, Goldstone modes. I think, I guess the point that I'll make in just one second is that I don't really think it's possible to break time translation, continuous time translation symmetry. At least I'll say this in just one second. So in that sense, you know, sort of irrelevant. I don't think it's, it, in the end, it turns out we will only ever, as was sort of, you know, alluded to by the question, we will only ever be breaking discrete time translation symmetries. And in that case, there's no Goldstone whatever. Yeah, please. Yeah, are there any time scales associated with this symmetry? Because uh, if we wait long enough, then the system will eventually thermalize, or uh, am I missing something? Good, super, super good question. So what I would like in general when I def define phases of matter, and we'll see that in one second, it's a point that I'll emphasize a lot actually, is that I'd like to take the thermodynamic limit, the limit as the system size goes to infinity, and in that limit, I would like that the lifetime of the order diverges, for example, I mean, in the strictest case, exponentially as the system size diverges. So for any finite size system, and maybe Anatoly will talk about this in the next lecture, for any finite size system, as you, if you fix a finite size and you go to infinitely late times, exponential late times, you get Poincaré recurrences, there's lots of stuff that kills the order. But if I take the limit as L goes to infinity, I would like in the strictest case to define a situation with order or symmetry breaking as the lifetime of that order or the autocorrelation time of that order diverges exponentially in the system size. But it turns out that that may or may not actually be possible in the context of time translation symmetry breaking. So for a lot of the lectures, I'll actually be quite satisfied as long as you have parametric control over how long the lifetime is, even if the parameter isn't e to the L. Super good question. Other questions? Amazing. Oops. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, thinking from the perspective of Anderson, let's say, and um, symmetry breaking as some sort of uh, rigidity, let's say, um, what would be the equivalent of the rigidity in this case? Yeah, so it, the equivalent, you know, we'll, we'll see again in just a second, is that we'd like whatever the nature of the order parameter, the nature of the ordering, to kind of be stable to small, generically locality preserving perturbations to either the initial state or the Hamiltonian or the equations of motion. And we'll see, I mean, I'll sort of define basically what time translation symmetry breaking should be sort of formally mathematically. And then we'll add kind of these two notions of rigidity exactly as you're saying to really elevate that concept of symmetry breaking to well-defined phase of matter in the sort of stat sense. Very good question. 
lost the questions. Okay, good. So let's continue for a second. So it turns out that, uh, that as I was sort of just saying over there, in fact, at this moment, you know, at least by this analogy, it seems, this analogy seems simple enough. It seems simple enough to be able to get, for example, periodic oscillations in time for some ensemble of initial states, just thinking about minimizing some uh, energy functional. But again, if you think about this intuitively, what I've said is really quite confusing. It's that I have a many particle system that's interacting, whose constituents are interacting, but the equations of motion are not time dependent. The equations of motion themselves are continue, have a continuous time translation symmetry. But then from that many particle system, at low temperatures, for example, all of a sudden the system starts to spontaneously oscillate. And this should feel to many of you very wrong if you've sort of you know, thought about physics. Because in general you might say, well, if there is an oscillation that spontaneously arises when I'm not causing any oscillation in the first place, shouldn't I be able to tether some little wheel to that oscillation and be able to extract work from that? And that kind of idea of this feeling very much similar to perpetual motion was initially back in 2012 and 2013, initially why people felt like this notion of getting spontaneously emergent periodic oscillations was sort of you know, a little bit tough to imagine. So it seems simple enough from this naive mathematical formulation, but I would say there are, there are and were, there are obvious and then not so obvious there were kind of obvious and not so obvious obstructions, obstructions to this. I think a little bit more precisely than appealing to things feeling like, feeling like um, perpetual motion machines is for example the fact that if we're thinking about a classical system, Hamilton's equations immediately imply, Hamilton's equations immediately imply that the many body system must be stationary, must be stationary at any energy minima. Here's kind of a very simple to state obstruction. Hamilton's equations immediately imply the system must be stationary at any energy minima. And for example, this already kind of tells us that we should be getting periodic oscillations in the ground state. And I think it was already kind of accepted early on that in the ground state, these periodic oscillations could not occur in either classical many particle or quantum many particle systems. But it turns out, I would say, more generally, there was very pretty work from Haruki Watanabe and Masaki Oshikawa. A couple years later, back in 2015, where they essentially proved or showed that persistent oscillations, that persistent oscillations cannot arise in any system that is in equilibrium, so here I'm thinking in thermal equilibrium is some thermal state, cannot arise in any system that is in equilibrium with respect, with respect to a local Hamiltonian. So already you can kind of feel in your gut there are some obstructions. There's some obstructions that you can immediately write down that are obvious at energetic minima. And more generally, a couple of years later, Watanabe and Oshikawa proved that persistent period oscillations cannot arise in any system that is in equilibrium with respect to a local Hamiltonian. So here is, at some level, our starting point for getting into the main topic of the school. <laughs>
both classical and quantum, exactly. Yeah, very good, yeah. Now, the question for the next section of the, of the lecture is indeed kind of what loopholes do out of equilibrium physics give us? And that will be the focus of the next section. But before we get to the out of equilibrium context and specifically Floquet, I would like to argue that there is in fact another challenge, another challenge to having this type of order or this type of time crystalline order. And this challenge is directly connected to Anatoly's lectures Anatoly's lectures, where he emphasized to you that ergodicity breaking was somewhat inevitable. And in particular, okay, maybe I'll, uh, maybe I'll go over here again. This is going to be a short subsection, but important enough that I want to elevate it to its own subsection. It turns out that although it's not often taught this way, it's very natural to think of spontaneous, spontaneous symmetry breaking, or in general, the emergence of a phase of matter as a particular form, as a specific form of ergodicity breaking. Ergodicity breaking. Here, I won't be so worried about subtleties between what's the difference between chaos and ergodicity. At the moment, here, all I want to emphasize in terms of what I mean by ergodicity breaking is that, in particular, it's important for any phase of matter, and in particular in the context of spontaneous symmetry breaking, that I don't want my system I don't want my system to forget its quote unquote initial condition. Right? This seems patently obvious. If you had a ferromagnet, for example, an Ising ferromagnet, you'd like that if you were in the all up state for a macroscopic chunk of a magnet, that it wouldn't just at some point forget that it was in the all up state and go to the other low energy configuration, which is all down. But that, by definition, is some form of ergodicity breaking because the system doesn't want to forget its initial condition. So it's very, very natural to think of spontaneous symmetry breaking as a form of ergodicity breaking and to think about this symmetry as playing the role of what separates the different pieces of the phase space. Yeah. Fine temperature is also fine. Fine temperature is also fine. So actually, you know, yeah, I, 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 I'm, yeah. Finite temperature is even better. It doesn't have to be just ground states. Yeah. If you start from an integrable system, okay, fine. Right. Yeah, so they're, they're, they're sort of different at some level, I would say. Integrability is way stronger at some level because there's an extensive number of conserved quantities. So in that sense, you know, there are many, many integrals of motion that constrain the dynamics. And here, in the context of symmetry breaking, it's really the symmetry that's playing that role, and it's way, way less stringent than the integrable case. So we can have spontaneous symmetry breaking that's a rather stable or rigid concept, but integrability typically we think about as relatively fine-tuned, that most generic perturbations, or all generic perturbations, will essentially destroy integrability. Good, so just maybe in words one more time because I like this. For example, in the case I think someone called out earlier of the XY magnet, in the case of the XY magnet, one has to have 
one must have, in fact, ergodicity breaking. One must have ergodicity breaking so that, so that the system, so that the system remembers, precisely remembers the specific, for example, the specific complex phase phi that it's ordered to out to infinite times. And again, here, I'm thinking in general in the thermodynamic limit. So, I'll define time translation symmetry breaking in slightly more equations in just a second. But let me, at this point, just in words, define what I think is the proper way to think about this topic, which is kind of an ergodicity-centric definition of a time crystal. This ergodicity-centric definition of time crystal, I would say, is that we have the spontaneous breaking of a time translation symmetry where some ensemble of initial states, already working in a little bit the language of rigidity here, where some ensemble of initial states exhibits persistent oscillations, persistent periodic oscillations, persistent periodic oscillations with a temporal phase shift, and I'll recast those three words in just a second, with a temporal phase shift that, and here is the play on the word ergodicity that really remembers, that remembers its initial condition. What I mean here is very, very simple. What we've been saying thus far, although it's not possible, what we've been saying thus far is that if we think about a very, very natural definition of time crystal, we have a many particle system whose interacting description does, has a continuous time translation symmetry. The description at the level of equation of motion is unchanged in time. If there are some emergent periodic oscillations, for example, in the configuration of the field phi, then in order for you to remember your initial condition, you don't want to just you know, have random phases, hop at random phases in the oscillation. You want to know where in the phase you started so that you're always oscillating at the same phase. Right? If you forgot about that initial condition, sort of you know, where in the cosine t plus phi you were, then that would precisely be the case where you're no longer spontaneously breaking the time translation symmetry where you'd average out that oscillating behavior. Good. So this temporal phase shift, what I mean here is just where in the oscillation you are, literally. Where in the oscillation you are. Okay. Okay. So now we're ready to really get into the setting that kind of is related to the slightly, the, the more non-equilibrium side of things. And in particular, we're going to now enter the discussion of flow K time. I'll put in parentheses here. It's not often called this way, although you'll see in just a little bit why I put this in parentheses, what are called flow K time crystals. Although, again, I put in parenthetical density wave, and what I mean here is that the last two topics have been about the spontaneous breaking of first a spatial translation symmetry, and then the spontaneous breaking of a time translation symmetry, and here we're going to be discussing the spontaneous breaking of a discrete time translation symmetry, something that I will call discrete S tau B.
And again, because it was, I think, asked, I don't remember, by a very nice question, let's start, since we've been doing it the whole time, with our spatial analogy. Spatial analogy. You've already seen, you've already seen how states with grad phi non-zero can be favored energetically. And this was a, a very, very good question that was asked over here. This is indeed, it is truly indeed spontaneous symmetry breaking. But if we were a little bit more precise, but if we were a little bit more precise, it's the spontaneous symmetry breaking of a continuous of a continuous space translation symmetry. In the sense that when I was thinking about the description of my equations of motion, I had stated that, for example, the Hamiltonian, I was imagining being invariant under arbitrarily small translations in space. Okay. So we have a continuous group that's formed by the generator of such translations. So again, before getting to time, let's do space first. And this is very much related to a couple of questions that were asked. You can ask, what about the same physics, but in a lattice. So again, for those cold atom aficionados, you can imagine these are atoms in an optical lattice. For those solid state aficionados, you could imagine that these are electrons in some solid state material. You really want to get fancy and have a larger scale, electrons in a more ray potential. But just pictorially, what I mean by this question is now the following. Pictorially, what I mean by this is that one might imagine that the potential energy landscape underlying atoms could be something that itself is already periodic in space. And if we have a lattice spacing given by A naught over here, then the continuous translation symmetry of space has already been broken down. So this means that the spatial translation symmetry has already been broken down to only a discrete translation symmetry. You can clearly see that it's discrete because the only thing that this is unchanged by is translation by, for example, the underlying direct lattice vector, A naught. Again, keeping with the atomic physics analogy, we could imagine two physical scenarios if we had atoms, atomic density, atoms living on top of this optical lattice potential. We could have a scenario where the atomic, let me just get a slightly larger piece of chalk. You could imagine a scenario where the atomic density the atomic density could be uniform. It could be uniform on top of this optical lattice potential. And in this case, this would correspond to there being no discrete symmetry breaking. Then we would say that the atomic density 
is the same at every lattice site within the optical lattice potential. But you can also imagine a scenario where the atomic density, atomic density or the electron density, or the atomic density could further, could further break the already discrete, the already discrete spatial translation symmetry, right? So you could imagine that we have repelling atoms, and now instead of wanting to have a uniform density in every lattice site, they repel and they form some sort of a solid, some sort of a crystal on top of the underlying lattice that it lives in. And it turns out that the phase of matter, it's very, very, not very, uh, conceptually, pictorially, extremely similar to thinking about the emergence of a crystal, where we said, okay, we could have grad phi being non-zero, so that now there's a crystalline pattern that is a, now has a discrete symmetry, which is a subgroup of the continuous symmetry of the Hamiltonian. In this case, you have that the state of the system is now governed by a discrete symmetry group, a discrete subgroup, which is a subgroup of still the underlying but already discretized spatial translation symmetry of the underlying lattice itself. And instead of calling these phases of matter, in this case, when we discreetly break the spatial translation symmetry, a crystal, these are oftentimes called density waves, density wave patterns. So for example, you'll hear in the literature that these are called, in the context of electrons or charges, charge density waves. In the context of spins, spin density waves. That's the concept. So you can now already see a little bit my naming convention over there, as was kind of presciently alluded to. In the flow K context, we're really going to be talking about the breaking of a discrete time translation symmetry to an even smaller subgroup, which probably more properly would really be called a time density wave pattern, but for whatever reason, for whatever reason, the, the word time crystals is stuck. Okay, so just very, very quickly, just summarizing in a little table, right? We can have the breaking of a continuous spatial translation symmetry. And this one usually calls crystalline order. We can have, imagine the breaking of a discrete spatial translation symmetry. This oftentimes is called a density wave phase of matter or a density wave pattern. We can imagine trying to put space and time on the same footing and imagine the spontaneous symmetry breaking of a continuous ah, time translation symmetry. But as I've already emphasized, there are, except in kind of specific cases of singular Hamiltonians, in general, um, not allowed. And the remaining focus of our discussion is going to be on the case of discrete time translation symmetry breaking. And here precisely is where flow K physics will enter. So enter flow K. And this, I think probably would be more properly called a time density wave, but really these days is often called a discrete time crystal or a flow K time crystal. And I want to emphasize that already with this kind of a pseudo table, you already see a little bit the answer to the, one of the two questions that I emphasized in the very beginning that you should always ask when someone's trying to introduce a modern research topic to you, which is why flow K? And the answer to this in some level is context. 
really context is, you know, the answer, let's say, to kind of question two. It's that really, because we're thinking about discrete time translation symmetry breaking, we need to break down the continuous time translation symmetry into a discrete subgroup in the first place, because we know that on quite general grounds, it's very hard to get continuous time translation symmetry breaking. So Floquet is kind of where the rules of the game allow one to ask this question. Okay. So intrinsically Floquet in a way, another way to say it, it's only a reasonable or a relevant question in the specific context. Good, so let's continue for a second. So again, now I think you guys all see the analogy very, very clearly. What about the same kind of a question? What about the time? What about a lattice in time? And indeed, much of kind of the modern research on time crystals, or specifically S tau b, the spontaneous breaking of time translation symmetry, is focused on flow K systems, periodically driven systems, where, again, let me write this down, where really the equations of motion describing the interacting multiparticle system come back to themselves, come back to themselves, themselves after after some discrete period of time. And again, I had already written this in one of the very first boards that I used, but what I mean by that is that I have a Hamiltonian, for example, if I'm thinking about that as the description of the equations of motion, such that h of t plus two pi over omega d where omega d here is the frequency of the periodic drive, where this is the driving frequency, comes back to itself is equal to h of t. Again, omega d is the driving frequency, and t naught equals 2 pi over omega d is the driving period. The driving period. Again, as Anatoly said, you will remember from your first year physics course that you, the generic expectation, expectation, the generic expectation, and this really is first year physics, the generic expectation that you should already have about such periodically driven systems Perhaps the simplest setting where I'm almost certain you've seen this, either in the context of uh, linear oscillators or as we'll soon see, nonlinear oscillators. The generic expectation is that, in fact, a simple harmonic oscillator driven at frequency omega d responds at frequency, responds at frequency omega d, and this is kind of independent of its natural frequency. Very, very intuitive. You drive a system, you shake a system at a particular frequency, you expect it to respond at that frequency, and I'm just emphasizing the example of a simple harmonic oscillator because I suspect that all of you have already thought about this. But it turns out, again, I think it's still pretty unsurprising. It turns out that in fact, this fact that we have here, in fact, this is also true, this is also true of many, I would say most, almost all, of many 
complex nonlinear systems. Complex nonlinear systems that independent of the details of their underlying microscopic structure, that if such a system is driven at frequency omega d, in general, its observable properties will respond at frequency omega d or integer harmonics of omega d. So the idea is independent, independent of kind of microscopic details, microscopic details, the observable properties, properties will respond at frequency omega d or integer harmonics of And this generic expectation that observable properties, that if you drive a system at frequency omega d, that the observable properties of the system will respond at frequency omega d, this corresponds, I hope people can see this, uh, this corresponds, this corresponds to the no symmetry breaking case. Sort of draw that pictorially, but it sort of makes sense. Symmetry breaking every single time corresponds to the system exhibiting properties that have a smaller symmetry group than the underlying equations of motion. In this case, the underlying equations of motion are drive at frequency omega d. So if your observable properties are also responding at frequency omega d, that certainly looks like you are consistent with the symmetries of the underlying, although now periodically driven equations of motion. Okay, so we don't have an infinite amount of time, but let me try to get through to a good stopping point. I apologize if we go over just slightly. By contrast, by contrast, let me at least try to define this. We say that discrete S tau B, or the spontaneous breaking of a discrete time translation symmetry is said to occur, is said to occur if the system exhibit properties, exhibits properties that oscillate at a subharmonic of the driving frequency. At a subharmonic of the driving frequency, and what I mean by that is that some omega d over m for integer m greater than 1. So again, drawing the analogy to space, we say that spontaneous breaking of a discrete time translation symmetry is said to occur if the system exhibits properties that oscillate at a subharmonic of the driving frequency. And just to, again, kind of make the picture analogy, instead of the optical lattice potential that we imagine on the board just to my right, imagine that we're looking at time. And we say, for example, Clearly, if we have a Floquet Hamiltonian, the equations of motion are coming back to themselves every period. So 3t0, 4t0, 5t0, etc. And if we have a property that's oscillating at a subharmonic of the drive, it's tupling the period. It is a subharmonic, so it's a higher harmonic from the respect of a period, or sort of a higher tupling from this perspective of a period. So in general, again, using this kind of a picture, the subharmonic response of associated with discrete S tau B breaks, 
the symmetry down, symmetry down, from the initial already discretized symmetry group, which is T to T plus, excuse me, N T naught, where N is in Z. So this is this symmetry group corresponding to the original discrete time translation symmetry. T gets translated to any integer, so T naught, two T naught, three T naught, et cetera. That is the group associated with the equation of motion. The symmetry group associated with the equation of motion. It breaks it from this, for example, to T goes to T plus N prime T naught, where now we have N prime is in M times Z. So if you have discrete S tau B, M fold discrete time translation symmetry breaking, we say that a system has properties that oscillate at a subharmonic of the drive omega d over m for some specific m. And this means that the symmetry group is broken down from t plus n t naught where n is an integer to t plus n prime t naught where m prime is an m times the integers. Super obvious. And pictorially, for example, we could give the example of period doubling of period doubling oscillations, which are a subharmonic omega d over two, so m equals two in this case. And this would, for example, correspond to a situation where observables kind of in this time lattice come back to themselves every two driving periods, although the underlying equations of motion are symmetric, come back to themselves every driving period. So very, very similar to the spatial density wave pattern, but now looking at some observable measured in time. Okay, uh, one last line. So at some level, the goal that we'll start with tomorrow morning is we'd like to get, we would like to get, and this again goes to a question over here, we'd like to get some form of stable or rigid discrete S tau B, discrete time translation symmetry breaking in a many body system. And again, in this case, I will at this point discuss quantum and classical on pretty equal footings. In the classical case, much like Anatoly, we'll go through canonical transformations that try to rotate away the period doubling. In the quantum case, it'll be unitary transformations that attempt to do exactly the same thing. But if we're able to get stable, rigid time translation symmetry breaking, discrete time translation symmetry breaking, this is kind of the beginning of having a well-defined discrete time crystal as a particular phase of matter. But it turns out even with these caveats about requiring discrete S tau B and requiring some notion of stability and rigidity, still we'll have to sharpen the question a little bit further before we get into the really, really non-trivial aspects of when you can have this type of a time crystal, and that will be deeply connected to what Anatoly's been talking about, which is a way to break ergodicity in a many particle system. Okay, so I think that's probably a pretty good stopping point, and we'll continue tomorrow, thanks. Thank you. Are there some urgent questions? You define the, the time lattice there yeah. with this driving frequency. Yeah, exactly. But, but then there it's a different uh, frequency or is it uh, No, no, the it's the same frequency, sorry. So I imagine, sorry, I should have been more clear about this. So my flow K system is defined by being driven at a particular frequency. 
and that particular frequency defines a period with which the equations of motion come back to itself. So thinking in terms of the language of symmetries, I would say if the equations of motion have a particular symmetry, a transformation that renders them unchanged, and that transformation is moved by period T naught because it always comes back to itself. And then if I think about sort of trying to imagine time and writing down what exactly, when exactly the equations of motion come back to themselves, they come back to themselves every period, T naught, two T naught, three T naught, four T naught. And all I was emphasizing over here was, again, much like we have an optical lattice potential breaking down a continuous spatial translation symmetry to a discrete spatial translation symmetry. Here, the periodic drive breaks down the continuous time translation symmetry to an already discrete time translation symmetry. But on top of that, if you want to imagine symmetry breaking on top of that already discretized time translation symmetry breaking, already discretized time translation symmetry, then you can have a scenario where you have a subharmonic response or a period tupled response where the system's observables come back to themselves at some larger multiple of the period as opposed to just responding at the underlying period itself. Is that clear? Good. Yeah, please. So it's, it's, it's very complicated. So this is something that we'll unpack in a little bit. But you know, let me explain. Let me help to explain the subtlety of your question because you asked a really beautiful question. So in some sense, what we emphasized over here that was stated was that well, it might be interactions. How do interactions manifest? They manifest as a term that corresponds to how the particles talk to each other in the Hamiltonian. And so interactions can change the configuration of my field because it lowers the energy, for example, for them to be further apart. So at the end of the day, symmetry breaking, when we think about this in equilibrium, it's always related at some level to energy and energy penalties that prevent fluctuations from messing up order. But in this case, energy isn't conserved, so I can't actually appeal to the same thing. So it's sort of more of a locking phenomenon, but we'll, to understand exactly why it happens, we'll have to wait a little bit. But it's a very, very good point that you're making. I do. So sorry, I, I, I can't, I can't so say one more time, one more time. So the, uh, for this case, you got m is greater than one, right? So why it can't be m less than one? Yeah, but if m is less than one, then it's again a higher harmonic. If it, let's look at this for a second. If m is less than one, for example, then basically, you know, it's sort of, you know, uh, higher harmonic response of the system, and that higher harmonic response of the system would not break down from a period perspective like this, would not break me down from a particular group to a smaller subgroup. So it's actually very natural. Like if you literally you know, take a piece of jello and you tap on the jello with a, uh, this, maybe you did this, I did this in high school, but you take a piece of jello and you tap on it with a little mallet and then you basically put it through a synthesizer and then you Fourier transform basically the kind of oscillation oscillation response of the jello, you'll find that it responds to the frequency you're tapping at, at two times the frequency, four times the frequency, all of the higher harmonics, but it doesn't have any peaks at subharmonics. So it turns out the subharmonics are still not that hard to get, but you don't usually get it from basically tapping or shaking a system. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's another case. So you can imagine there are situations indeed where you can have um, subharmonics, for example, but that are not integers, for example. So you could have a situation where you know, m is 5 thirds or something like that. You can get those types of situations. Oftentimes, what that corresponds to is essentially having kind of like five regions of stability and a period three cycle through the five regions of stability. So you can get those things. There's not, I wouldn't say, you know, it's not 
super non-trivial why those emerge. Like sometimes in like quasi-crystals, it's you know very, very non-trivial why you have that type of a structure. But most often, you can indeed get subharmonics or time crystals with fractional frequency responses. But oftentimes, there's some underlying structure that sort of gives that response. And it doesn't usually happen in a totally spontaneous way. Great. Um, so if there are no more questions, uh, let's thank Norm. So now we